Ashley and Nina. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you two? We are great, thank, thank you. Good. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to help us with this um, project. It really means a lot to us that you're willing to help us out by this, taking this interview with us today. Oh, you're welcome. So what uh, you're recording it and you'll use it for your project or your assignment. If yes. you would be so kind as to share a copy of the recording with me as well so that for we sure. can ha have that at our agency also, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So where do you want to begin? Um, so we will um, start. And Dr. Ashburn, you are aware that we are recording. So thank you for giving us the consent to do so. Yes. Um, we will go ahead and get started with the questions, if that's OK with you. Yes. Um, so. The first section of questions we have is regarding the demographic questions about um, you. And so the first question we wanna ask and we're interested in knowing is that, what has fostered your interest in psychology specifically and the topic of the family mediation? So I've worked a long time in various communities. And what I've appreciated is being part of a team rather than working in isolation and also being involved with organizations that support families to try and resolve things uh, outside of a court context, ideally. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a really good field or area of interest, I believe. Um, the next question is, what has inspired you to get involved with the uh, organization, so with the London Family Court Clinic? I came to the London Family Court Clinic in 1999, so I've been here going on uh, tw more than 20 years, as you can tell. Yeah. I worked previously on the east coast of Canada and in northern Canada in the Thunder Bay area. Mm -hmm. uh, when I did that work, it was very much in isolation. I wasn't part of a team. And uh, so as I began to work in the field and hear more about the great work happening in London and the work of uh, uh, Dr. Peter Jaffe and others at the London Family Court Clinic, uh, when a position became available, that's what brought me to London and to the clinic to be able to work as part of a, a large group involved in the education, training, and clinical services. Wow, you've been working before I was even born, I think about yeah. it. Yeah, I was born yeah. in 1999. So. Yeah, I was born in 2002, so you, I wasn't even here yet. <laughs> well, you can, you can tell by the color of my hair, I've been in the field for a while, yes and uh, working, working in different locations and uh, mm -hmm. uh, always sort of uh, been involved in supporting families and helping families sort of uh, look for and um, you know, reclaim their resilience and to support them and kind of moving forward with their lives. So, so you know, the whole vision, mission and philosophy of the court clinic is, is really a, a key element to think about. So when you, when we, when we reflect on what the vision stands for, um, it talks about caring communities, you know, resilient children and families moving beyond the justice system. And our mission is designed to ensure that we're integrating specialized clinical services, education and research to again support uh, families in reclaiming resiliency and moving beyond the, the court process. It is amazing what you guys are doing at the London Family Court Clinic. Yeah, it's uh, it's really like you gave us a very um, detailed and uh, sufficient response to what response to what we were looking for in terms of like the values and your mission of the London Family Court Clinic, and uh, we we completely support that. Thank you. you know, our our principles that sort of guide the work are clearly uh, respect and trust ensuring that there's inclusiveness in the work that's unfolding, 
uh, service excellence, of course, and collaboration in the work that's, that's done, collaborating with individuals and families and other community organizations. We value uh, our clients, our um, staff, volunteers, and students that are involved with us um, through training programs, et cetera. Clearly, we have to be accountable and we have to be transparent in the way in which we do services and we uh, really work to build a culture of success, not only for those that we're serving, but also the community organizations that we work collaboratively with. It's really inspirational, yeah, actually. It is, it is. And we're going to be asking uh, other questions about how that ties into the topic yeah. of the uh, resilient children, specifically in preschoolers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead with uh, the next set of questions about the organization and the programs that the London Family Court Clinic um, offers to the children and the family. Um, so I'm gonna start off with, uh, what are the values that the London Family Court Clinic stand for in relation to the child's health and their well-being? So we talked a bit about some of the principles and values that guide the work already in terms of the you know, inclusiveness, et cetera, um, service excellence, collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. The other sort of key element is that we um, work with families uh, ideally earlier. So uh, prevention, if at all possible. So uh, what we try to do is to connect with uh, families that get referred to us who are perhaps at risk of potentially being involved within the court system, but aren't necessarily there yet. And of course, we also work with families who are part of the court system. So youth that may have gotten in trouble, uh, families that are going through separation and divorce, et cetera. That's amazing. Um, so what specific like services and programs do you guys offer to support these families and need, uh, whether they're court related or on the road to being? Okay. Well, we have, it, it varies from a uh, year to year, but we have in the neighborhood of 13 to 14 different service groups. They're really designed along four key pillars of the organization. They break down under either specialized assessments, specialized interventions or treatment programs, training and, ed and education as a third pillar. And the fourth is research and consultation efforts. So these programs, uh, when you look on our website, they get broken down into services that are really for children and adolescents, some that are designed for families, some are designed to support community organizations, et cetera. You'll see lots of um, acronyms um, referenced uh, on our website and in some of our material that we put out. But, you know, one of our programs is the uh, CWP. It stands for Child Witness Program. It supports uh, children and youth that have to go to court and testify. And so it's helping them kind of understand what the process is going to be, supporting them in not being quite as anxious, et cetera. A number of other services deal with uh, counseling, mental health related services for uh, children, adolescents, or families. And then some are designed to address uh, the request for uh, specific types of assessment or consultations that might aid in a process that's uh, moving forward, whether it be court or whether it be another organization that's doing treatment planning, et cetera. Our largest program is the ADR Link program. And it entails four different service models. It's designed to work with families that are um, involved with or referred by various children's aid agencies in the southwest part of the province of Ontario or First Nations communities. And there are 10 um, across the southwest of Ontario. These are uh, families that are trying to resolve things and develop a plan on behalf of their children that meets the um, uh, safety aspects, but also uh, works to try and keep families together and support the healing process. And the four models that are available under that program deal with child protection mediation, family group conferencing, um, the uh, uh, 
indigenous uh, dispute resolution processes or ODR they're sometimes called and then the fourth option which deals with a, a specialized framework to respond to sort of high high risk uh, case scenarios etc we have various disciplines it's multidisciplinary in nature so we have nursing psychiatry psychology social work psychotherapy um, and a, a number of individuals that are sort of child, um, uh, you know, or uh, have a lens of case management intake type of uh, work on the services that are in place. Wow! Wow! Yeah, well, the you already answered. Disciplinary our... approach is really uh, is really important in our opinion to mm -hmm. help to be able to integrate all the pieces together in terms of uh, increasing the family's quality of life overall. Yes, the, the ability to uh, draw on the various uh, strengths of the different disciplines, the different uh, techniques that they may use to support families. So, so you know, some of our families are in conflict because they're uh, trying to sort out a medical issue. So right now, for example, with the current pandemic and um, some of the, um, decisions that families, particularly families that are going through separation and divorce need to work right. through. There are um, questions about uh, medical, you know, do you get a vaccine or not? Do you do school in person or online? Some of those um, matters can end up being disputes and some of our services can help resolve that. Well, you just went ahead and answered our next question as well. Um, so from all the programs that you've mentioned about which uh, program or service do you think is most effective in helping like preschoolers and overcoming the negative thoughts and feelings associated with the process of divorce? So for, for children, what they're really looking for, preschoolers and um, school age children, they're, they're looking for a sense of stability, predictability, uh, reassurance when families are going through um, transition and the, the changes that are unfolding. So being able to support them, whether it's through a mediation process or whether it's through something that's referred to as a voice of the child uh, report or a child inclusive mediation, those types of frameworks. There's a number of services that are specifically response or both within the um, areas that are uh, troubling for them when they're sorting out uh, shifting from one household into uh, two. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so what age groups you typically see most um, like younger children, older children, like we're specifically talk about preschoolers, but we're curious about like what age that these programs target and how frequent these programs are offered throughout the year, if it's like a longer process for certain families and like what type of activities that you guys incorporate for the children to understand what's essential, what's happening going on with at home with their families and in the just the divorce um, process. Okay, uh, it's a great question. The, the program or the service is really dependent on um, what's being uh, requested. So some services are um, a one-time event. So for example, uh, the uh, family law information centers offer uh, family members, the parents going through separation and divorce, a, a one-time session that deals with what's referred to as a mandatory information for parents program. And it's to help them understand uh, what they need to do to move forward in their planning when they're going through separation and divorce and what to think about in terms of the children. Some other types of programs are um, more long-term. So counseling is dependent on kind of the needs and age. Sometimes it's done as a group context. Sometimes it's done individually. Sometimes it's family focused in nature. Uh, one of the programs, New Ways for Families, um, has a six to nine session limit, and it's focused on really helping prepare parents and, uh, and then their children to kind of understand and 
uh, learn to better communicate as families going through the separation and divorce process. So it, it really depends on uh, not only the needs of the family, but you know what program you're referring to. Mm, that definitely makes sense. Of course, we want to find a program that's specific and for the families and what their needs are. So, um, Mina, you're going to go ahead to ask about the yeah, cost. The time. next question. Um, we are aware that the programs you offer at the uh, London Family Court clinic, uh, clinic require a certain fee, and it depends on the variety of factors that are listed on your website. Like, um, can you please tell us about the range of costs for your divorce support program specifically? Certainly. The First of all, there is a sliding scale fee available in regards to counseling. So, uh, you know, based on you know the uh, circumstances of the family, um, the ability to work with perhaps a, a, a student who's in training at a reduced cost and um, the, the, who's supervised by one of the um, senior uh, clinicians, that kind of thing. We do offer uh, some work at a legal aid rate, so at a reduced rate and tied into kind of the rates that are paid for by uh, Legal Aid Ontario in terms of those aspects. Some of our work is done uh, what's referred to as pro bono. You'll hear lawyers talk about that, but in terms of that's, that's free and is um, sort of um, in combination with other organizations and may be done in kind. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our programs are uh, funded by government, and so some of the um, programs that relate to youth in trouble with the law and some of the counseling and mental health needs uh, mm -hmm. is fully funded. Mm -hmm. we, provide, mm -hmm. we provide counseling through the probation office, and there's no charge to clients for those types of things. And, and some of these families um, are also dealing with separation and divorce. So there's, a, there's overlap sometimes in terms of the, the issues at play. The other thing that we do is um, because we're a, a, a research training and um, a, a center for you know, developing uh, new programs, new initiatives, new resources, we, we write away to uh, different funders and granting organizations for funds to be able to provide new programs, new services, and sometimes we're successful in receiving uh, a grant that supports a program. Uh, one this past uh, couple of years through the uh, pandemic was one that's referred to as the Shared Decision-Making Program, and this is one that's operated by the London Family Court Clinic and London Health Sciences Centre. Yeah. Again, it's designed to deal with very specialized mediation matters and to deal with uh, situations where there's both a medical question, but also families that are uh, struggling with making decisions and they may be separated and, um, you know, or divorced families that are um, trying to sort out some of those things. So yes, there's a cost. Um, mm -hmm. Some families have um, uh, funding available to them through their work, um, employee assistance programs. And so uh, in, in their benefits package, they would have that information so that it's, uh, you know, the, an assessment might be funded or so many counseling sessions might be funded uh, in the course of a year. And so um, there's also that resource that's, uh, that's available. That's great. You actually went ahead and answered uh, the next question we were about to ask, which is like regarding is the organization funded by the government? You have mentioned that most of the or like a, uh, a large amount of the programs you offered are government funded. And that's um, good to hear. Just going back to um, the uh, decision making service or program you uh, specifically talked about. Uh, it seems like a, um, a very interesting program for us to discuss. Um, how frequent is this, uh, how frequently is this program offered throughout the year in the London Family Court Clinic? It's a, uh, it's a short term program. So typically, you know, there's a medical question or a particular issue that a family is struggling with. 
Right. And so it may require uh, just a couple of meetings to get some information to help them kind of reflect on that and then make a decision. Uh, mm -hmm. Families can come back um, more than once. So if something new arises within the course of, uh, you know, uh, later in the year, uh, mm -hmm. they can come back and partake of that uh, again. But it's, uh, it's designed to be fairly quick and responsive and to, you know, uh, allow the family to make a decision and then move on. That's a, I, I personally think that's a great program because um, a lot of families often struggle to make decisions. There are a lot of factors that factor into like the difficult process of decision making and they need that like quick emergency help. And so you're always there to guide them. So um, it's a really interesting program. Um, are some of the programs privately funded? So some of the programs are paid for by the, the family right. uh, or their benefits program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way sort of last fiscal or last uh, year that we sort of did a review, we were about two thirds funded by government and one third funded by research grants or uh, fee for service type programs. So that's kind of how the breakdown went. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to ask some questions about um, the availability and accessibility of the programs. And you've mentioned that um, some cases are referred from court. Um, so we were wondering if any of the programs are available to the general public um, and if families are placed on wait lists, if there is um, like walk in appointments that you could make at the London Family Court Clinic. So, so typically they're not walking in you know they might be sent over from court um, right. to to um, get some background information and schedule an appointment uh, families can make referrals their um, their physician or their lawyer if they're involved in that uh, process can make referrals other organizations can refer a family because of uh, you know the need for a specific program that we offer that kind of thing so um, various ways in which they can kind of show up uh, at our agency are, are, are possible. Exactly. In terms of uh, we wait lists really depend on the, the service and the program. You know, if you're uh, court connected, you know, we, we uh, let families kind of know when we would uh, begin to provide the service. And if, that, if it wasn't sort of within a sufficient time frame for them, they may go and seek out another professional that uh, perhaps could see them sooner. Uh, we try not to, particularly for a very difficult uh, situations where people may be in crisis, um, clearly um, not to have folks sitting on wait lists. That's, that's not the way to deal with those situations. And so it varies on a case by case basis as to, you know, um, when they might be responded to. Gotcha. So essentially you need to be referred by from certain professionals in order to be connected with the family court clinic. Okay. Typically, but families sometimes contact us directly. You know, they uh, sometimes they will do their research. They'll look at our website. They'll go online and look at uh, kind of what's available in the London and surrounding area. And then um, they may make contact with us and then, you know, the process sort of commences from there. And like you mentioned that you have to have like a background before you take them as us clients. I think that's very important to understand what the situation they're dealing with before going into these programs. Yes. So doing, uh, doing an initial intake and screening process, you know, checking to make sure that um, if there are any sort of safety issues, uh, yeah. dealing with um, uh, violence or other aspects that may be um, part of the scenario for some family situations needs to be well understood so that you can um, ensure that services are done in a way that's appropriate to the needs of that family and the, and the context. Yeah. So if the family contacts you, the organization directly, and they have that background information and they've done their research and they have provided the background of their case and what they're going through, 
um, you are certainly like willing to help them, right? Without the need of referral. Uh, yes. Well, they're they're making their own referral, so it it might be that it's done on the consent. So if it's a family that's going through separation and divorce, yeah. uh, both parents might voluntarily consent to working with our organization to right. develop a plan and to move forward. It doesn't have to involve the court, right. but, but sometimes they get stuck and, um, and then uh, the, the request might come from the lawyers or from the court process. Great, so there, there are multiple like ways and routes to like go depending on the situation of the family. Yes. And where they're at. Awesome. So we're going to move on to the next um, section, which is regarding the specific uh, program improvements and future steps. Um, you've mentioned and talked about a variety of uh, uh, great programs that you have offered at the Family Court Clinic. Uh, is, is there any specific improvements that you are, are considering or think need to be implemented to any specific um, programs, family support, child support programs. Uh, can you tell us more about those improvements and what have inspired you to implement such improvements or plan such improvements in the future? Well, there's certainly been uh, a number of changes to legislation, changes to laws uh, within Canada. Uh, the new Divorce Act, which came into effect in uh, 2021, uh, really sort of highlights and brings forward information around uh, how to include voice of children in the process, how to ensure that families are aware of alternatives to court, so an uh, alternative dispute resolution process if need be. They're uh, really designed to follow up on some of the things that were um, first put forward from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the UN Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to ensure that um, you, uh, a cultural lens is considered, that children uh, stay connected to families in their communities as part of the uh, framework going forward. The other sort of, sort of positive shifts, you know, we've seen uh, some uh, access to mediation right at the court context and also within the community. We uh, would like to see more sort of child inclusive mediation possible or um, a greater use of things such as a voice of the child report to really bring forward the child's uh, and youth's perspective when decisions are being made about them. And so I think those are some of the key changes that are um, are, are critical. Uh, the other thing that, you know, we work alongside other organizations. So for example, the Office of the Children's Lawyer provides some services. So they will do free assessments for some families if it's been accepted as a referral. They can provide legal consultation to children at no cost, and they can also do uh, some of the work, whether it be a voice of the child report or a, an assessment that really speaks to parenting, parenting plan evaluations, that kind of thing. So there are different ways for families to access services out there, but mostly it's about making sure that they know how to find out about it. One of the most helpful uh, contacts, I don't know if uh, either one of you have ever been to the courthouse, or ever had an opportunity to go online and look at the family law information centers that are out there in terms of, so there you have access to information about community resources, you have access to um, a brief meeting with a lawyer or mediator to really get at some of the um, nuances in terms of what might be possible to help the family and to get some guidance. So if you're a family that, um, person who doesn't have a lawyer, you can get someone to look at your paperwork and kind of tell you what you need to do next and what, to, what the timeline is, that kind of thing. That's amazing. I feel like for families that need, is going through these tough times, they need these guidance and they need the help from anywhere they can get really for these supports to find their ways for help and proper treatments to ensure a, a 
you know, well-rounded family for the children and for the relationships of the parents as well after divorce. Yes, and it takes uh, a number of different uh, community organizations that have different roles to be able to support families. So for example, uh, if it's a family that is in need of what's referred to as a supervised um, access program, so uh, for either um, perhaps mental health reasons or um, challenges around substance use by one of the parents, it may be that a supervised setting needs to be put in place to ensure that uh, the child has a chance to spend time with um, the parent who's perhaps struggling and that there's someone available to ensure that it's appropriate going well, that kind of thing. And that, that type of service is operated here in the London area uh, by Marymount. And you know, it's kind of helping families kind of know uh, what other organizations are out there and what the different pieces are that they do that, that are also part of what uh, all of us collaborate on to ensure that families have access to a variety of services. Um, so uh, what I'm noticing in your responses, Dr. Ashbrown, is that the core values uh, that have inspired the London Family Court Clinic to think about and implement the all the improvements you just mentioned in the programs are basically, they all have to do with the benefit of the families in general and the children specifically, and to kind of uh, include the, the voice of the children and highlight the um, autonomy of the child in terms of you know participating in the decision making because again children are affected by decisions parents make and it's really important for us to incorporate the voices of the children yes uh, that, actually we're in the process of setting up a um uh, a new component of the organization. It's going to be referred to as NAVON or um, Navigating Onward. It's really designed to um, work together, cultivating healing, hope, and discovery in families. And um, that's a component that uh, the community will be hearing more about over the next few months, but it's really, um, again, working collaboratively with families and family members to help be responsive to what they need at that point in time to uh, keep things moving in a positive direction. Yeah, that's great. I really um, think that collaboration and like not just giving straight out advice to the family and like, you know, placing ourselves as certain like experts is important. The collaborative nature is really important and it's a core value and, you know, um, responding positively to the needs of the family. Most definitely, the, the family members, uh, children included, mm -hmm. need to need to have a say in what it is that they want help with, yeah. what they want to work on, uh, what their hopes and dreams are, uh, whether they're able to continue that work or whether they need a, a break, perhaps from counseling for a little bit and then to come back later, whether mm -hmm. they are uh, comfortable to work and um, be part of a group process for this or whether they prefer more individual or family focus. So most definitely they should be, you know, steering the ship and making the decisions to uh, facilitate that. Yeah, that, that's great to um, have a, always a client centered approach. Yes, mm -hmm. most, most okay. definitely. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we're going to ask a few questions um, in regards to our research question and the target population that we're um, researching about. Um, so for the parents, uh, what are the age ranges that you normally experience with? Um, and do you notice any like of the age trends among divorced and separated parents? And why do you think these trends exist? So one of the things that uh, that's changing is what's referred to as gray divorces. So there are more now in terms of um, kind of at the grandparent or elder age who are calling it quits in their relationship. And so that's a, that's a new trend in terms of some of the aspects. You know, they, they may come to us uh, again for some help in 
sort of mediating a resolution uh, going forward or in looking at kind of what, what the best plan is. Uh, in terms of other ages, obviously we, we deal with um, children, uh, adolescents and families that are of uh, varying ages and uh, background. We work with um, different uh, cultural consultants if, if needed. So some communities have more of what's referred to as a collectivist um, cultural lens. And so we might work with the Muslim Resource Center uh, for social support and integration, for example, or with an indigenous community, with perhaps the clan mothers or the elders um, that are involved with this particular family to ensure that they feel comfortable in, um, in being involved with the services and um, helping to sort of craft what's going to be helpful for them going forward. Amazing. How it's very client centered and it's really like you're really aware of what the client's needs are and culturally I think that's really important because different cultures handle divorces and their families mm -hmm. are different so I think it's very mm -hmm. crucial for you guys that you guys are acknowledging that the cultural differences do play a major role within the family yes most okay. definitely uh, so how does the London Family Court Clinic assist preschoolers in the proper social emotional development during the period of the parents' divorce? So one of the things that is really important for uh, parents to keep in mind and remember is what's most helpful for children is to uh, be kept out of the conflict and to be able to uh, experience both a safe and predictable um, living context. So predictability around when they're gonna see each of their parents, um, safety around those aspects, to have other sort of very basic questions uh, answered, you know, for, for children and preschoolers. It's often about where am I going to live? You know, where's the other parent? Uh, when will I see the other parent? Uh, if it starts as they get a little bit older and they're involved in extracurricular things, you know, am I going to, uh, are we going to have to move? Will I have to change schools or daycare? Will I have to uh, stop attending uh, dance or soccer or hockey or whatever? And so those are some of the things that, that may arise. So really providing, um, support for parents to be able to talk with their children and communicate in a way that um, reduces the child's uh, anxiety or uh, stress level, uh, helps the parents to uh, remem remember to be focused on the needs of the child and not just on what's going on for them. So some of the programs such as uh, parent coaching, some of the parent education programs that are out there, the New Ways for Family program, some of those things are really designed to really enhance better communication and um, answer questions for children, et cetera. That's incredible. Um, so why do preschoolers need these services that you provide and how will these services help with their development in the long run? Specifically social, emotional development. Yeah. So children, can move on and do okay after their families go through separation and divorce. Mm -hmm. If the parents and extended family members handle the, the transition well. So if they work to uh, reassure children, if they work to answer their questions, if they work to ensure that children are not caught in the middle, you know, they're not made to be the messenger passing you know, notes back and forth and then watching one parent get upset by what's in the note, that kind of thing. So it's, it's really about uh, reducing exposure to conflict and violence in particular and ensuring that they have safe and healthy relationships with both parents whenever possible. So from your experience, have you gained any findings from working with these preschoolers who are experiencing um, divorce and separation? So one of the things that uh, 
we've learned over the years and that, you know, it sort of uh, gets highlighted in some of the um, international um, uh, reports, you know, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, listening to children's voices, involving children um, in the, the process, not to the point where they're making the decision, but giving them some feedback, listening to what their questions are, um, helping them kind of understand what some of the changes are going to be and keeping them in the loop, so to say, so that they are not feeling um, ignored through those various processes are, are crucial. So for that to happen, it really requires uh, educating of the parents. It requires supporting the parents to deal with their own struggles so that they can be better tuned into and responsive to the needs of the children. And so that they are um, working really hard to keep conflict and other dynamics uh, at a minimum so that the children are not caught in the middle. That is very important, that's for sure. Um, have you noticed any patterns or trends between those preschoolers in terms of their thoughts and feelings that they have like told you specifically? So for, for many of them, it's, it's the questions that they have. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I touched on some of those a, a couple of minutes ago, but it's, it's really very basic things, you know, um, where is dad or where is mom or where's my other parent? Um, when will I see my other parent? Uh, where are they living? You know, they're worried about kind of what the change is and how the other parent is doing if, if they don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis like they normally would if the family was together. Mm -hmm. um, are they uh, still gonna be able to be involved in some of the same thing. So can they still see their friends? Will they still see their cousins? Or, you know, is the family uh, so divided that, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to see their cousins on dad's side because of the level of conflict and, and those dynamics. So it's, it's being able to help children express their voices, get those questions answered. You know, there's some good books out there. There's one where it's referred to as Dear Judge, where children, you know, sort of get to ask the judge questions about why this is happening to my family. You know, mm. you can sort of look at that as a resource. There's a number of other kind of wonderful books out there. You know, Mom's House, Dad's House uh, for Kids is a program really designed to support uh, children to a address their feelings um, when they're moving from one home to two homes uh, in, in their living context, those, those types of things, and, and many others out there. There's um, local libraries are wonderful resources for families. So your families may not have um, lots of money, but they may be able to get a library um, card and access to some of the books at the library in terms of um, explaining, you know, what kind of family this is, you know, it might be a step family, you know, I have step parents now, could be a, a family that is, um, you know, that uh, Robert Munch, for example, wrote a book that really focused on, you know, it's referred to as the enormous suitcase, and it's a child basically dragging their favorite possessions from one house to the other, and kind of the unknown, and children wanting those questions addressed. So there's lots of things, but it's, what we've heard from children and what children have helped kind of um, really hammer home for all of us is the importance of not losing sight of what their needs are with all these other changes that are going on. Right, and I think the, uh, the, the fact that you've heard uh, children and asking lots of questions like, where is mom, where is dad? I think when we read in between the lines of what they're saying, we notice that the questions stem from feelings of fear of uncertainty. They're worried of like the unprecedented future that's ahead of them. They're worried of change. Um, and so it's important for us to, the first step to answer those questions that may have so that they don't accumulate inside of them. Because I have like friends who, who had a lot of unanswered questions growing yes. up yeah. during childhood. And a lot of like, you know, does mom hate me? Does, why is this happening? Why, why are my parents separated? And they did not find any answers. 
and they grew up with a lot of confusion and gaps and that affected their social and emotional um, well-being later on. They suffered from uh, depression, anxiety, and they were like, uh, even when they went into relationships, they were very demanding from their partners to constantly validate them and assure them because they didn't get that assurance earlier on. And so I think it's really key. Yes, and you, you touched on a number of factors there. So there's a, uh, um, a, a professor at um, Waterloo who is um, Dr. Denise Whitehead, who's done quite a bit of research. Her, her dissertation research really looked at um, essentially adult children of divorce and you know, what sort of questions they had, trying to make sense of things, as you said, many years after the fact. And, yeah. um, and, and her research focused on that. Uh, many of us belong to an organization that's called the Association for Families and Conciliation Courts. Mm -hmm. And there's both an Ontario chapter and an international uh, organization. And this is bringing together um, those that provide parenting programs, those that do mediation, uh, lawyers, judges, counselors, mental health, uh, professionals of various backgrounds, those that run supervised access programs, and they sort of jointly get involved in training, sit at the same tables to have conversations about what are, what are the trends? What are you seeing in terms of families' needs? What are some of the difficulties? How do we address situations where children are uh, resistant, perhaps, to uh, going to the new household and you know, how to support a continuing relationship? with both parents, even though there've been changes. So um, we're gonna, thank you, Dr. Ashbrown for your um, deep insights. We're gonna go ahead to the next section, uh, which is regarding COVID-19 adjustments and modifications for the programs and services offered. So the first question is, how has the organization or the London Family Court Clinic adapted their services and programs as a result of COVID-19? And how did the services offered uh, change or shift during the pandemic compared to before or pre-COVID? It's a great question. Um, what you'll hear from many organizations is, there needed to be a pivot or a shift quickly to mm -hmm. being able to operate virtually. Mm -hmm. And now that things are kind of moving forward so that there are more people that are vaccinated that perhaps have um, uh, you know, a little bit more protection, there's um, many programs that are now sort of available in what's referred to as kind of a hybrid model. So you may be able to do some things in person. You may be able to do some, some aspects virtually. Uh, court, court operates that way. So, you know, um, you know, the last trial I was at, I did it virtually where I provided evidence um, through using the um, virtual technology basis to participate in a trial process. And all of us were in very different locations, but the trial still went ahead, that kind of thing. Many of our services now um, are resuming with some in-person components, but we still do uh, and offer for families the virtual. Uh, there, there are some families that have really uh, appreciated that because it means they don't have to travel. So they don't have to travel downtown, pay for parking right. uh, or you know the bus fare, that kind of thing. But it does require um, the ability to uh, have access to technology and to be comfortable with technology. And that's not the case for everybody, of course. So, you know, we, we have to be able to accommodate what works best for each family situation. And, and again, to do it in a way that's healthy. So at our office now, you know, uh, some people uh, might come in and you might have an interview where uh, people are behind a plexiglass screen now, you might do an assessment where uh, folks are wearing a mask, or you might do parts of it virtually uh, using Zoom or uh, uh, my, you know, Microsoft Teams or some uh, virtual technology and other parts where it's done in person. So that's the big shift. The other thing that was um, sort of a, a big shift for some of our programs was that 
uh, one that we talked about briefly before, and that was the shared decision making model, which was very COVID focused. Uh, it was special funding, it was uh, special government funding related to um, responding to COVID context and to uh, be able so that there was no charge to families to be able to have access to that. And again, it was mm -hmm. to uh, support uh, being able to continue to uh, make sure that people can move forward with their lives despite the pandemic, etc. I think uh, even with the pandemic, the services and programs provided are still as accessible as possible to uh, families. And um, the fact that you accommodate each family's needs and whether they're aware of how to use technology or no, or yes. is, is, is really um, important. Um, do you anticipate specific services or programs to continue to change uh, permanently even after the pandemic has ended? Uh, yes, uh, I anticipate that we will continue to see uh, what's referred to as the hybrid model mm -hmm. for services, for court, for um, different programs. So some will be done in person, some will be done virtually, uh, some will use technology to facilitate certain components and um, and the real sort of key change will be that families will be able to decide, mm -hmm. do you want this to be in person or do, would you prefer to use technology so that you don't have to travel? So, you know, we might have a family in Ottawa that's mm -hmm. accessing services. Um, they're not having to travel, they're making use of the virtual means to be part of a program, etc. Yeah, so would you say the pandemic had a positive impact, at least in terms of like, making the programs a bit more accessible to a wide range? I, I think the positive impact was really about um, pushing all of us to do better, mm -hmm. to be um, flexible, and responsive to learn new techniques and new ways of being able to engage using technology and um, you know administering something using technology if, if you're doing an assessment that kind of thing so so yes I think there there have been some um, positive aspects that have come out of a very terrible uh, worldwide um, pandemic. Yeah, and we were all kind of forced to adapt to yes. using technology. Like I'm one of the people who's so old school and I didn't know what Zoom was until like the pandemic and I had to like attend all my lectures via Zoom. So it's crazy. Well, it, <laughs> it, it's really sort of become part of the training that all of us now go through. So not only will you yeah. do, you know, a, a workshop on, you know, responding to a certain type of uh, situation, but you may also then do training on how do you adapt that and provide it virtually? How do you ensure yeah. that your clients um, are prepared if it's going to be done virtually? What are the steps that you go through to you know, alleviate their anxiety about Zoom, their panic that might um, right. entail if you lose the connection? You know, what are the things that you've done ahead of time to help the family um, know that they just sort of reconnect, you know, not to panic, you know, um, Re reconnect and and move forward that kind of thing so yes i think we've all we've all um gained some new knowledge through right, these sure. these changes absolutely um the next question related to covid19 adjustments also relates closely to our topic of divorce um so how or have you noticed any specific changes in the rate of divorce among parents during the period of COVID? So have you perhaps noticed an increase maybe in the rate of divorce during the pandemic due to the miscommunication and issues stemming from couples spending more time together in lockdown? So there's... Uh a number of different sources that might be of interest to you to look at this very issue. Mm -hmm. So the, the Child Welfare League of Canada has been looking at and trying to understand the impact of COVID on families. Mm -hmm. 
The Vanier Institute of the Family has also been doing some research and evaluating um, uh, this same scenario. Different health sectors across the country are part of looking at a number of uh, different ways of what's been the impact of COVID for, for families overall. One of the things that I've heard from various uh, organizations and professionals, judges, lawyers, um, mental health professionals, is this sense that the isolation has been uh, very difficult for families that are struggling. It has been difficult for those that um, you know, aren't working, don't have some of the social connections, don't have the same visibility. So if, if yeah. children are attending online school, you know, they're not going to school or their daycare and they're not being seen by others. So if there are um, things happening at home that are concerning, it may not be as, as evident. And so those are some of the things that many of us worry about in terms of, um, how all of this is impacting those families. Uh, one judge uh, at a meeting I was at recently made the comment that um, couldn't believe that anyone is still married given the number of new applications that have come in uh, to deal with separation um, matters and that clearly there's been a, a huge impact of the pandemic and the isolation and the stress of you know being in the same space and right. getting getting on each other's nerves, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, definitely. For sure. I noticed those things within my own family, how we're getting sick of each other a little bit <laughs> <laughs> from being at home way too often. Yeah. So I definitely agree that there are many factors that the pandemic has really yeah. encouraged that separation and divorce for families, regardless of age range. And going back to um, when you told us that many grandparents are getting divorced, which personally I was kind of surprised from that that many like seniors are, div are deciding to yeah. get divorced and after all those years <laughs> right yeah. yeah so the other thing that all of us are very concerned about is the um you know uh, fam you know the violence that ha happens in ha in some households and yeah. the again the isolation and um you know the the safety aspects for um, children and parents in the midst of that that may not be um, as as known because if you're not going to see your family doctor in person mm -hmm. and everything is done over the phone they may not pick up on some things if if you're not, you know not going out to schools and uh, daycares people aren't kind of seen that, that someone arrives with bruises, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, th things, things can get missed, unfortunately. And, and, and then the whole stress and um, worry related to that. Yeah. And even related to like preschoolers and children, if they're, not, if they're less visible and they can't talk to people and access counselors and various resources and teachers, they might base violence and, and suppress all of their negative feelings and not feel comfortable to tell anyone because partly because they're not seeing anyone. And so. so. So the other thing that, yes, most definitely. And the other thing that has been noticed by many is that the much younger children who learned about the pandemic, learned about the virus, as, as they might say, um, mm -hmm. are then very hesitant. So they're much more nervous mm -hmm. in a social context and worry about you know, their health, worry about everyone else. And so they may be more reluctant to go to school, go to the daycare, be involved in a sports program, et cetera, and uh, really sort of um, isolate themselves, stay at home. Mm, yeah, um, I know little children who have learn to stay isolated even now that we're slowly starting to transition back to normal they just want to stay online and they don't want to go to in-person school so it, it's interesting to see that aspect of the children's and yes. how might it affect the future children's social and emotional development yeah. okay so we're going to wrap up our interview uh, with a few questions about the future plan of action 
Um, so what would you say are the needs of the London Family Court Clinic now to support families during these times of divorce? And how will meeting these needs affect the preschoolers' social emotional development? So good research, you know, funding of good research and evaluation of services and programs are um, important so that uh, families get a sense that this is a uh, a, a service that's built on best practice uh, frameworks and, uh, you know, as, as you say, client-centered, responsive to the um, needs of the various participants, et cetera, is, is critical. So um, the ability to provide uh, not only government-funded services, but the ability to provide good coordinated services and good uh, research and evaluation of those aspects are, are really important. So we've got a couple of projects on the go right now at the uh, London Family Court Clinic that are uh, providing um, mental health services within uh, one of our um, Indigenous communities near London, out in uh, the Oneida uh, community. We've got another one that's designed to look at a specialized uh, therapeutic program and uh, developing some uh, videos that really support uh, the group um, learning that can happen within that therapeutic context. And those come about through um, uh, research funds and, uh, and always there's a component that's built in in terms of the evaluation of those aspects. So, so that's, that's really uh, what continues to need to be done by us and others. Yes, resources and education is always the key to make a change in anything. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So as like we are university students, as you know, so what would you say that our role as university students to raise awareness about the services to provide and what um, call to action would you ask of the general public to help these amazing programs to continue on? Well, one of the key things that we really appreciate about students and student inquiries is getting to know students, getting to have a sense of um, who are going to be the new professionals in the future, um, be available to work within different organizations. And um, the key role that students can play is to you know, begin to understand the wide range of types of services that are out there, the wide range of job opportunities that are out there that they may uh, be able to participate in, and then to uh, be able to spread the word about kind of what's available to help families uh, with, within the community. And again, you answered our last question as well. Um, yeah, we were planning to ask you, how would you like us to promote our um, programs and services? And of course, we really do, in, we are inspired by what you guys do at the London Family Court Clinic. And we're definitely gonna, even beyond this project, we're definitely gonna keep in touch with what the London Family Court Clinic is developing and what programs are being offered and just the great things that you guys are doing for families in the area of London. Well, thank you, and thank you for reaching out and for uh, your questions, which were um, well thought of. And uh, and I appreciate you sharing this information with your class, friends, families, etc. And um, and you know, encouraging people to take a look at our website, other organization websites, to have a sense of kind of who does what out there. And um, and if you haven't been to see a Family Law Information Center, I highly recommend it as a, uh, as a spot to be able to um, you know, go online, take a look at some of those things, and, and again, you know, kind of understand uh, what, what's out there and what's available to support families.